Hey there, folks. It's me, Michael Bach, your diversity dude, and this is Talking to Canadians. Politics is a blood sport. It takes tenacity and resilience to enter politics, let alone stay in it, and it's often a thankless job. Today, I talk with a member of Parliament from Ontario who has challenged the preconceived notion of what a politician can and should be. From rocking braids in Parliament to pushing for gender and racial equality in and out of government, Selena Caesar Chavan is an unlikely politician who has never shied away from rocking the boat. Here's my conversation with Selena Caesar Chavan. Selena, welcome to Talking to Canadians. Hello, thank you for having me. So excited to have you. So, Selena, you're a black woman in po- politics. You're passionate about gender and racial equity, and you are an outspoken advocate. Let's talk about it. Okay. So, let's start with a with a, a bit of a walk through your life. Um, can you give us sort of the Coles notes of Selena Caesar Chavan? Oh, for sure. So I was born in Grenada, which is in the Caribbean, 1974, which was an amazing year. That's fantastic. <laughs> and um, spent the first two years of my life there. My parents came to Canada and I stayed there um, for two years. I lived with my grandparents, came here, lived in Rexdale for a couple of years, then moved to Brampton, where I spent most of my life, uh, did extremely well in grade school and high school, you know, I was smart. I was beautiful. I was, you know, popular. I was like a triple threat living, Uh, living. And uh, then I got to university and that all ended. Uh, It took me six years to finish a three year degree. I graduated with a 1.58 GPA. No, you Um, didn't. I swear, I swear, there is life after 1.58 GPA. In fact, I think the University of Toronto just like gave me the 0.02 0.02 extra because they're like she is ruining our international standards just they're, get her out of here just yeah. please leave <laughs> just please leave just yeah just leave. get out of here right so i went back to school and it took a fourth year undergrad research course fell in love with research ended up owning a company resolve research solutions um because i you know i did my first mba i couldn't find a job and you know, did really well with that company. It was a healthcare management company, did really well with it, working on brain conditions, neurological conditions uh, for about 10 years. And then did my second MBA and decided I was going to get into politics. Let's let's talk politics because in 20, 2013, was it, you decided mm-hmm. to run in a by-election? Yes. What was that like? Because you didn't win. So, Let's just lay it on the table. You did not win. Right, right. So, but I don't play to lose. So, nice. right. So uh, in 2013, I was doing my executive MBA at, at Rotman U of T. And there's a politics component of the course. And I had not been interested in politics before that moment. Never took a poli sci course, didn't watch it on TV, barely knew who our prime ministers were, barely knew who our members of parliament were. Like the real, the real definition of someone who is just totally disengaged from the whole political process. Then we start talking in this course, and I'm like, oh my God, this is fascinating. Man, I want, I want to like do something. So I became a member of the Liberal Party because I always voted. One thing I always did was voted, vote, but I I never really paid attention. I just voted Liberal because I, you know, I I liked sort of their values, et cetera. And so I became a member of the Liberal Party in February of 2014. So this is like two months later. And then a month after that on International Women's Day, because you're a member of the party, they send you these emails. And on March 8th, International Women's Day, I get this email that says, invite her to run. Do you know a woman who's, you know, exceptional and creative and smart and could lend to, you know, creating a better Canada or something like that? And I was like, yeah, hell yeah, I, I'll do that. Mm-hmm. And so I replied back and said, I'm interested. And, you know, two months after that, unfortunately, the member of parliament who was in riding, the riding, uh, Jim Flaherty, he passed away. And all of a sudden I'm in this by-election. And, 
you know, all eyes are on Whitby because at first I thought, well, she's never going to win in Flaherty's riding. But then all of a sudden I started gaining this momentum and it became like a real thing. Like I could win. And unfortunately I lost. <laughs> So then in 2015, uh, she got game. She's, you know, you're going to do it again. You run in the channel yes. and you win. And I win. Yeah. So what was, what was that like on, on that day when you suddenly are the MP for Whitby? Well, that's when the reality kicks in, right? Because I thought, because, you know, I've lost before. So there's an opportunity to lose again. And that always played in the back of my mind because after I lost that first election, I was really depressed for, for a couple of months. I just didn't get out of bed. So that was playing in the back of my mind that I could lose this thing, even though I changed the strategy of how I ran the campaign and was okay with that strategy. I just thought, man, if I lose, I'm, I don't know how I'm going to handle it. But then you win. I, I won. And it was like, uh oh. Now what? <laughs> now you have to do the what job. Do I do? Like, yeah, what do I do? What does this even mean? Like, I, I, I've never even paid attention to what MPs did before. Yeah. So I was a fish out of water. Like, that's when you start gasping for air and thinking, oh, my gosh, I need to actually do this job. What was it like, uh, uh, you know, at the door? And, and for those listeners who've never been involved in a campaign, it's a whole lot of door knocking. Um, and talking to people, um, what uh, what was your experience knocking on doors, particularly as a black woman in Whippy? Yeah, so Whippy is about ninety percent, or you know, high eighty percent Caucasian riding, and I'm the first black person, person of color, elected in Whippy. You know, I really have to say that it was an amazing experience knocking on the doors and, you know, getting people one-on-one -on -one and saying that I am going to, you know, I'm running to be your, your next member of parliament. And they would say, you know, Oh, I don't like the liberals. I don't like your leader. I don't like this. I don't like that. And I say, well, you, you're going to love Selena. <laughs> and that, that was my hook. The hook was Selena. And that, I think a lot of, you know, I didn't win in Whitby because every liberal, you know, only liberals voted for me. I won because some liberals, some conservatives voted for me, some NDP voted for me because they had confidence in who I was and that I was going to be authentic and, and myself. that's a, a reality for a lot of, of local ridings is people vote for the individual, right? Like it's not uh, – Sometimes it's a commentary on the leader, but oftentimes it's it's really about the individual. So, you know, you you had a good experience at the door. Um, then you get to the hill. Uh, what are some of the standout moments on the hill for you? So I call this experience a beautifully painful experience that I've had in politics. So there have been some really, really high moments. I mean, and, and I'm not talking about things like, you know, I met the former president of the United States. I, you know, was able to travel and do those. Those are kind of parts of the job things that were, you know, highlights. But for me, the really great moments was, was when I was able to speak up and, and change the status quo on things. When I talk about mental health and when I talk about uh, gender or racial equality in it, and I, and I, you know, do it in a way that's provocative and, and changing, like, you know, putting the braids in my hair and, you know, doing that speech about that. Those are, those are transformative, sort of socially sure. transformative issues. But they also, when you talk about those things, you get the blowback. You get, you know, well, maybe you're not cut out to do the job if you have mental health issues. <laughs> okay, we're still there. Um, or you get the, you know, you, you know, you're only talking about black stuff. You need to stop talking about that. Or, you know, this is, it's too much. And I, you know, or I, or I get, I get carded whenever I come into the building, you know, it's, it's who are you and what are you doing here by security? And, and, you know, their job is to know who the members of parliament are. I'm the one 
chocolate female face out of 338 people. You think you'd remember mine first. Anyhow, there, there were there were instances where I felt microaggressions and the racism come full force. After four years, has your perspective on politics changed, particularly as a woman of color? Yes. So I'm not running. So it must have changed a little bit. Um, I I just think that I don't, and I'm not sure if it's as a woman of color necessarily, but I think it is as a individual who is very outspoken. And as a very outspoken individual, there are certain parameters between which you should operate. And I operate sometimes outside of those parameters because I'm like, no, this is a really important issue. We need to speak up about this. And it's not all the time that people appreciate that. So talking about intersectionality, talking about mental health, talking about these issues that, you know, are often whispered about because nobody wants to talk about them. Nobody wants to talk about the barriers and the struggles that people face on a daily basis. That becomes too much. And it's, it's, you know, this, this woman who's constantly talking about the others, talking about, you know, uh, gender and race and sexual orientation and people with disabilities and religious minorities, like, oh, just, just, you know, just lay off of that a little bit. Let's just talk about the middle class. I'm like, well, people who are trying to join the middle class face exceptional barriers if they fall into one of these groups. And that's why we need to talk about it. So I, I found it was more, there were more, there was more pushback because I spoke up about these issues and I, I spoke the truth on a lot of them than it being because I was a woman or a black woman. And I don't know, you know, I don't know how to measure that. Yeah. Well, and it's, it, it's how you can't disconnect the two. It's not like you can mute your ethnicity or your gender. You, you, you wear that every day. Um, and the, uh, you know, the reality is party politics is, uh, you know, as much as politics is local, once you're in party politics, uh, there's a whole lot of towing the party line. Well, and, and, and absolutely, I, I agree with that. But I think for me, you know, have you seen that that movie, uh, Finding Nemo, where the, the turtles are going down the East Australian current? Yeah. It, okay, so they're going down the East Australian current and that little squirt one the tiny turtle gets flung out of the currents and i in the last few weeks i've been really thinking about that scene in the movie because i feel like for most of politics i was in that current you know i was going along it's going really fast and furious and i was you know trying to look at what's happening on the outside and making sure that we are actually the, the current is actually going in the right direction but i can't and I'm, i feel like i'm missing things so, you know, I stick my leg out and I talk about mental health and it's like, oh my God, there's this eruption about, you know, this uh, and member of parliament is talking about mental health. Holy crap. It's like the biggest thing since sliced bread. And then I, I wear my braids and I'm talking about body shaming and how it affects uh, women of color and, you know, how we, we should, black women in particular, and how we shouldn't be shamed for what our body looks like. And I stick my, my leg out even more and I get rollback, but I get praise from the community for that. And so I felt like I've had my leg halfway in, you know, sort of towing the party line and halfway out. And then when I decided to be an independent, I was like, you know what? I can't, I can't do both. So I just took my leg out of the current and, you know, cause it was, it was tough. It's tough riding that, you know, half of your body's getting beat up by the current cause it's on the inside and half of it's not. And that was, it was not sustainable for me. So uh, what role, Selena, do you think politics plays in addressing equity and inclusion? Huh, that's a great, that's a great question. And I'm going to say that it plays a small role, but it's not the role. And when I say that, I mean, I don't think that we are going to create the type of society that we want because somebody created a policy that dictated to Canadians how we're supposed to behave. 
So for example, we've, you know, the government that I was a part of, <laughs> the, the, the artist formerly known as, uh, <laughs> the member of parliament formerly known as liberal, um, was, you know, we, we put in place policies around blinded uh, name hiring in federal mm-hmm. jurisdiction. Um, you know, we, we put in sexual harassment legislation in federal jurisdiction. So all of these things that are supposed to remove barriers from people from, from accessing the workplace, from being safe, only happen within federally regulated workplaces, not, which is about, you know, five to 10% of Canada, not the whole country. The other thing is, even with a name blinding, name blinded a hiring policy, at some point you need to see the person that you're hiring right. or the yes. people that you're hiring. And so-and-so is going to walk in with a, you know, an ethnic name and so-and-so is not going to walk in, is going to walk in without one. And at that point, you need to decide still, how do you remove those biases of when the person actually shows up, right? Unless you hire them just without seeing them based on a blind resume. So the changes that need to happen in our society need to come from, from people. And, you know, I was listening to Barack Obama speak on David Letterman. David Letterman has a new show on Netflix Mm -hmm. called My, My Next Guest Needs No Introduction. And, you know, he said that a lot of what happens in politics does, has it partly has to do with the ability to lead and legislation and regulations, but it has more to do with shaping attitude, shaping culture, and increasing awareness. So I, I, I really found that powerful because when we talk about mental health, when we talk about equity and inclusion, when we talk about you know challenges that that you know people of color, different sexual orientation. Uh, persons with disabilities face, that is increasing awareness. That is where our society, our communities, our countries, our people have an opportunity to play a much bigger role than any policy government could put in place. So I want to talk about something you you mentioned, uh, you know, you get blowback from people who say, well, why are you talking so much about the black stuff? Um, Why are you talking so much about the black stuff and i'm putting that in air quotes for <laughs> yeah me, for sure I'm putting it in air quotes. Well, because i'm black right <laughs> that's oh that's my god i didn't one. notice but it before oh it's a shock every morning isn't it? it's a it's a shock yeah i got up this morning i was like oh my god i'm black. So black oh my god i'm a it's woman so wow okay jeez um and you know, if I don't talk about it while I'm here, if I don't put out there the stories that are uncomfortable and, you know, make people cringe a little bit, if I don't put those awkward stories out there, like, you know, when I'm in the bathroom and a woman puts her wallet down by the front, by the door, like, why would you put your wallet by the door? But anyways, and then walks in and says to me, like, looks me in the eye and says, don't steal my wallet, okay? Like that kind of crap, you know, we end up as, as I'm just going to talk from a black woman perspective, as black women, as black people, we internalize that. That becomes our burden. We, we have to bear that. We have to think about it. Oh my God, I can't believe she told me not to steal. Well, did she really think about it? Still? Oh, da, 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 da. And we internalize, no, no, I'm not internalizing that shame and neither should anybody else. We, we put those stories out there. We need to, I need to talk about my experiences, even as a member of parliament, even as someone who has been in this job for two years, people know who I am, security knows who I am. I still can't walk on the hill without somebody questioning why I am there. Why are you here, ma'am? Well, because I'm here to go to work. Well, where's your pass? I'm a member of parliament. Oh, oh, sorry. Well, yeah. no, you're supposed to know this. Like as, as security, like, the, the woman in the washroom, that is, that, that's a different level of, of attitude that needs to be addressed. If we can't address it, if we don't talk about it. So uh, me keeping it and not putting it out there that this is a problem, these kinds of comments that you make about people 
are a problem. These microaggressions that make people feel less and less and less about themselves on a daily basis is wrong. And that is why really great people leave good organizations because they're constantly bombarded with these, these comments, these attitudes, these choices that they have to make. I think it's the same as when you go and you have to choose a male and female mm-hmm. washroom and you're, you, you don't identify as such. Why do people have to make such, such silly choices in a day and make them feel less of who they are in their workspaces? Eventually, that person who could have been really great, had really great ideas, is going to leave. So you mentioned the term microaggressions, just for everybody's knowledge. Yes. What's a, what, what is a microaggression? Microaggression is something, it's not a blatant or overt racist act. It's something that is subtly said or done in a way that makes you not necessarily second guess who you are, but makes you feel like you don't belong or that you shouldn't be where you are. And I, I think on a, on a regular basis, that happens to people in, in schools and communities and workplaces. I mean, just, you know, just talking to, to black women about, you know, their hair not being professional enough or taking a, a child out of school because her hair is too poofy. That, I mean, well, that I think is just blatant, blatant mm-hmm. racist. Yeah. <laughs> I think we're crossing the line of full on racism at that point. That's, that's, yeah, that's totally crossing a line. But it's 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 this it's this tone of you don't belong, and it's it's consistent. It's re- it's repeated. It's it's the joke that someone says that is makes you feel slightly uncomfortable, or makes you cringe, or raise your eyebrow, where you don't really know if it was inappropriate, but you feel like it was. It's those those kinds of things that need to be spoken up about a little bit more because that, those progress and then turn into blatant acts and then turn into something else, and we need to stop it. And I do think you know when, uh, as my as a gay man living with depression, I've I've taken up my own space in these topics, and I think it's important to uh, give voice to make sure people understand the lived experience of the other. And I think about, I was giving a presentation actually in Durham region not too long ago. And um, I called on a a woman, uh, there were uh, two black women in in the audience. And I, I looked at, at everybody and I said, how many of you have ever had someone without asking permission, touch their hair? And everyone kind of looked like, what is he talking? And then these two, Whoa, these two hands went up and I yeah. called on one of them and I said, could you please explain to the audience what I'm talking about? And she got up and, and people were dumbfounded. Yeah. They said, that doesn't happen. And she said, it happens all the time. All the time. And it is that, that, I mean, that's a perfect example of a microaggression, but it's, it's also that moment of saying, no, you have to know that this is occurring. And, yes. and so that when you see it happen, you can call out the person and say, what did you just do? You just assaulted somebody by yeah. feeling like you could touch them without their permission. Uh, and it's, exactly. it's important to make sure that people have that awareness. Yes. Well, you know, Whitney, Whitney Davis wrote an article in Variety.com about CBS. And I encourage everybody to read that article called CBS has a white problem. And it actually articulated, I found myself nodding at every single microaggression, overt act of racism that she experienced. And you could have just changed CBS for politics. And it, it just completely articulated my sort of the negative side of my experience in politics. And you could probably swap out most organizations for CBS at that point. Oh, uh, right. absolutely. The, certainly the experience of, of people from black Afro-Caribbean heritage are, are, are their experience is very different than other racialized groups. There is a hierarchy to racism, sadly. Um, yeah. So you're not running in the upcoming election. No, sir. So what's next? Have you figured that out? Why does everybody ask me that? That's like the default question. We want to know what's going to happen with Selena. You know what? So I've been 
advised that when someone asks me this question, I'm supposed to say, I'm exploring various options and I'll, you know, get back to you. <laughs> but I'm not very good at lying. So, <laughs> so I'm not really doing anything. I'm actually writing a book right. that I've been writing for the last maybe three or four years and um, hoping to have that out by next year or something like that. I don't really know the timeline, but that's all I'm really focusing on. I'm not, and, and it's not a book about just politics. It's a book of, of the lessons that I've learned. It's supposed to be a self-help, you know, leadership kind of, of memoir that, that just talks about my experiences in a, in a way that is, that will enlighten and enrich and allow others to feel like the, the experiences that they are having in which they feel alone in are not unique to them. That people have these sticky stories that they need to tell. And sometimes they're embarrassing and they're not, you know, favorable and, you know, we're ashamed of them. And this book is to say, put those stories out there and, and know that your vulnerability or sharing your vulnerability allows others to build resilience and strength. And and that's what we need to do for each other as I'm human sure beings. Be really inspiring for a lot of people. So yeah. what advice would you give to a person of color uh, thinking of taking a stab at public life? Hmm. So I would say that I'd give this advice to anybody. So it's not just people of color. It's, it's anyone who, uh, who feels marginalized by the political process. So that could be any number of people. And what I would say is number one, and not just for the political process, for, for going for what you want, for going big, for either running in politics or, or going for that, that C-suite position or going into that leadership, whatever. Number one is they have to be authentically yourself. It sounds so cliche, but when you leave parts of you behind and you're not bold and audacious and you're your true 100% self, you will get eaten alive in the big picture. You, it, it, will, it will tear you up. And, you know, I found that that was happening to me right at the beginning when I was, you know, riding that current and not quite knowing which I was just following along, like, a, like you know, the turtles on the, on the East Australian uh, current. And that wasn't good enough for me. I needed to express some things. I needed to be there for a purpose. And you could only be in any position, whether it's running or otherwise, you could only be there if you're 100% there. And, the, and, and I say that understanding that a lot of people would love to be their 100% self in spaces, but can't because they may lose their job. And that, that I fully acknowledge that. I fully do. But we need to have examples of people who are going to say, you know what, I'm just going to do it because I can. And I felt I feel like that was a, a huge part of my role here in politics. Um, but I'd also say, with politics in particular, run. If you're feeling a, like you should run and you feel marginalized and you feel like the process is forgetting about you and you're not seeing yourself reflected in the process, run. But don't just run by yourself. Run in packs. Get your friends, get your people, get your communities, get your networks to decide that they're going to put their names on ballots and, and do it in mass numbers. And not only that, when you get there, wherever there is, whether it's politics or C-suite positions or whatever, when you get there, stay connected, support each other. Don't just decide to support each other when it's convenient for you and you know believe her when it's convenient and then leave her when it's not, right? We have to continue that network of strength and support and resilience because, because you'll get picked off one by one. And it, it will, it's crushing. And, and that's how I feel right now. I feel like I need to step away because I'm, I'm feeling a sure. little crushed. And I, I look at the next generation. I look at people who are you know, for, here for Daughters of the Vote, which is a program that gets young women to come to the house and see if this is where they want to be. 
And they say to me, Selena, we got next. We saw you as an example of being audacious and being bold and what change could actually look like. So we, we want to do this. And that was inspiring for me. So just run and, and, and run in packs and support each other, no matter, no matter where you are. That's great advice. So we always like to wrap up our conversations with the same three questions. I call them the light and fluffy. I feel I want like a musical interlude. Who are your heroes or heroines? Ah, my daughters, Candace Rain and Desiree Simone. Uh, Desiree Simone is actually the real politician. I just play one on TV. She's smart. She's crazy fun. She's 20 years old. She's been living in the UK for the last two years in law school. She's just this like total 100% person. And Candace Rain, who is my 15 year old, is Selena 2.0. She's tongue of acid. Yeah, I know, but she's like, she's way worse than me. Like if you think I'm bad, she has a tongue of acid. She's so dry, quick witted, just exceptionally smart individual. And I'm so proud to be their mother that it makes me weepy every every time I talk about them. I'm just so proud that they picked me to be their mom. I have a son too, but like when I talk about my heroes, it's it's my girls. Your son probably takes after your husband, which is probably disappointing. No, my son is 100% mine. He doesn't even look like Vidal. Yeah, sorry. What's your biggest pet peeve? Eee, uh, biting oh, your yeah. nails. No, uh, that's not. No. Oh, gee, oh my God, that drives me nuts. And number two, making noise <gasps> when you chew. Oh my gosh, absolutely. My, I'm going to say this on air. My husband does that and it drives me around the bend. So uh, what is your happiest and or guiltiest pleasure? Oh, that would have to be... You know, I always use this line in politics, like what what they talk about, you know, drinking the Kool-Aid. And I say, why drink the Kool-Aid when there's so much good wine in the world? (laughs) (laughs) A glass of anything, and this sounds bad, but I mean, it's, it's me. A glass of anything with some kind of alcoholic content, it just, it's just my, it's, it's like therapy in a glass for me, you know? I just, I love a good glass of wine. I love being with friends. And so there'll be a couple of things, you know, wine or anything with vodka is, no. is I love. And I'm not ashamed of that, although I talk like I am. Um, any kind of brownie with mm. that's warm with chocolate sauce mm-hmm. and vanilla ice cream. I could eat in mass quantities. No, yes. This has been so great. Thank you so much for spending some time with us and sharing your story. It's, you know, over the past four years, you've been such an inspiration and I can only expect that you're going to do great things from here on out. So thanks for your time. Thank you so much for having me. When I hear Selena's story, I get a new appreciation for the obstacles that women, particularly women of color, face when entering politics. To say it's an uphill battle is an understatement. It's easy for a cisgendered white man to enter politics, but it's an entirely different battle for people of color. It's essential that we continue to promote diversity in our elected officials. Our government needs to reflect the people, and Canadians are a diverse bunch. People like Selena challenge preconceived notions of what a politician is. Her diverse life experience helps round out government decisions and helps ensure all Canadians are represented. Though she's not running in the next federal election, I expect there'll be great things to come from her next chapter. That's all for today's episode of Talking to Canadians. Thanks for listening, and thank you to my guest, Selena Caesar Chavan, for sharing her story. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast through your favorite podcatcher so you never miss an episode. Connect with me on social media. I'm at Diversity Dude MB. And don't forget to stay up to date with everything CCDI is up to by visiting our website at ccdi.ca. Thanks again, and I'll be talking with you again soon, Canada.